Hello and welcome to worship for this Sunday the 3rd of July for Aberlour Parish Church. You join me in what is hopefully a break between downpours because I wanted to get outside and come down to the river because our reading today takes place at a river. We hear the story of Naaman in the book of 2 Kings who, seeking healing, seeking God's goodness, is told that it is as simple as just dipping in the River Jordan seven times. He can't believe it. His servants point out that if he'd been set a more difficult task, he would have done it. Yet Naaman struggles to accept just how easy it is to receive God's goodness. This is a God who offers freely absolute and infinite love. Let's worship that God in this time together. Let's pray. God, our God, as we set this time aside now to focus on you and become aware of your presence with us, we seek the fullness of your goodness. And as we desire to be people made whole in your spirit, may we know your blessing with us, your presence with us, and may we know ourselves to be made one with you as your beloved children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our reading today comes from the book of 2 Kings at chapter 5 and verses 1 through 15. Let's listen for the word of God. Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, was highly respected and esteemed by the king of Syria because through Naaman the Lord had given victory to the Syrian forces. 
he was a great soldier, but he suffered from a dreaded skin disease. In one of their raids against Israel, the Syrians had carried off a little Israelite girl, who became a servant of Naaman's wife. One day, she said to her mistress, I wish that my master could go to the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his disease. When Naaman heard of this, he went to the king and told him what the girl had said. The king said, go to the king of Israel and take this letter to him. So Naaman set out, taking 30,000 pieces of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of fine clothes. The letter that he took read, this letter will introduce my officer Naaman. I want you to cure him of his disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and exclaimed, how can the king of Syria expect me to cure this man? Does he think that I am God with the power of life and death? It's plain that he's trying to start a quarrel with me. When the prophet Elisha heard what had happened, he sent word to the king. Why are you so upset? Send the man to me and I'll show him that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariot and stopped at the entrance to Elisha's house. Elisha sent a servant out to tell him to go and wash himself seven times in the Jordan River and he would be completely cured of his disease. But Naaman left in a rage saying, I thought that he would at least come out to me. Pray to the Lord his God, wave his hand over the diseased spot and cure me. Besides, Aren't the rivers Abana and Farfar back in Damascus better than any river in Israel? I could have washed in them and been cured. His servants went up to him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, you would have done it. Now, why can't you just wash yourself, as he said, and be cured? So Naaman went down to the Jordan, dipped himself in it seven times as Elisha had instructed, and he was completely cured. His flesh became firm and healthy like that of a child. He returned to Elisha with all his men and said, now I know that there is no God but the God of Israel. Amen. So we have a mighty military man, Naaman the Syrian, who finds it for all his power and wealth, for all that he is respected and feared, for all that he has the ear of the king, it amounts to very little without his health. And the fact of his skin disease, probably something like leprosy is imagined in the story, sets in turn a fascinating series of events that we've just heard. It all starts with this little girl who had been taken as servant after battle, she mentions to her mistress, Naaman's wife, the prophet Elisha in Samaria. And in so doing, this little girl brings about an episode that brings together soldiers and kings and the prophet. 
in the interactions that we heard about, there would be many questions. How much did Naaman really expect to be healed? Why was he trying this, listening to the little girl? Was he simply desperate, willing to try anything? What about the king of Syria, who values Naaman so highly as to write to the king of Israel on his behalf and send Naaman with all that silver and gold and fine clothing? And then the king of Israel, who feared that he was being set a trap. He heard in the message an ultimatum that actually wasn't being set for him. But what he heard was, heal this man Naaman or there will be trouble. And then there's the faith, the confidence, almost the arrogance of the prophet Elisha, who seems so certain that everything will be all right, that the whole thing is so trivial as to not even require going out to meet Naaman. He just sends a messenger saying, wash yourself seven times in the river. And Naaman cannot believe that it should be that easy. He's outraged. There's no logic in it so far as he can see. There's nothing special demanded of him. He says the rivers back home are better than the Jordan. And to be fair, I'm reminded that that's something I thought when I saw the river Jordan in real life too. At points, the Jordan running through Israel is not much more than a muddy wee stream. Naaman turns to go home until his servant points out. If something difficult had been demanded of you, some heroic challenge, you would have done it. You would have overcome. How much more then this simple thing? Naaman was seeking the goodness of God. And in finding it, he expected that he would be healed. What he couldn't get his head around was that the goodness of God is granted not on the basis of the measures of human greatness. This story is a story about God's grace. It's a story which puts the faith of a little servant girl in contrast with the man who has everything. The last and the least of the world, forgotten, overlooked, not even free for herself. This girl knows something, something crucial that Naaman and all his might simply can't fathom. That God's grace is given freely. That it's not about our worth. It's not about us at all. It's about God's generosity. How often do we feel like we should have to earn God's favour? How often do we feel like God might be for us if only we were a bit better? If only we could stop doing this or start doing that? How often do we exclude ourselves from God's love because we feel that surely that can't really be for us, at least not unless we've earned it? Those sorts of thoughts are something that I find to be deeply ingrained in most of us. It's something I wrestle with often myself. It's something that comes up in almost every serious conversation about faith I have with anyone. There is something deep within us, something almost darkly seductive about the fact that we have to be good enough before we can understand ourselves as loved by God. And it's not true. That's not God's grace. I sometimes wonder if we feel this way 
based on pride. Not puffed up, self-aggrandizing pride, not the arrogance that we know the cultural mindset of Scotland wouldn't allow us, but maybe a different sense of pride, a quieter sense of pride where we feel like what we do or what we fail to do should make a difference to how God feels about us. And first hearing it might be odd to call that pride, but it is pride in the sense that when we think that way, we are confusing our limited human powers of action with the almighty heavenly power of God. As if anything we could do, anything within our power, could make a difference to what God has already done in God's power. Because this is what God has done. God has declared us God's own children. In Jesus, God has shown infinite love for the world, lived out as human among us. And because of Jesus, God has made us whole and promises always to make us whole again in every sense. And this, not because we deserve it, not because we have earned it or ever could, but because of the simple fact that God loves us and has chosen to be with us and for us. Grace, God's grace, demands nothing of us. No heroic task, no impossible feat. It doesn't ask us to be special. It cannot be earned. It is simply and freely offered. And that is so strange a concept to us that we struggle often to accept it. We, like Naaman, can hardly believe what we hear. Naaman's story, I think, was less about him gaining his health and more about his letting go of his expectations of what God is like. In our wondering about this story, in our reflecting on our relationship with God, are there things that we can identify today that stand between us and our acceptance of God's goodness? What can we let go of? Can we believe that the ultimate fact of life is that yes, absolutely God loves us as we are. Not because of what we have done, not because of who we have been or who we might yet be. God loves us. God loves us you because God has chosen to do so freely absolutely infinitely God loves you this moment and in every moment that's the truth of the gospel may nothing prevent you from knowing God's love Amen.
So go from this time to know God's absolute free and infinite love offered in grace and the blessing of God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.